Moore Angolari's research interests are in translation and migration, translation ethics, interpreting in war zones, the sociology of translation and interpreting, and philosophy of language. She is the author of, of several books, Translation and Migration, and Interpreting Justice, Ethics, Politics, and Language. And she's also guest edited two, guest edited two special issues uh, of The Translator, which, <coughs> excuse me, I'm, I just lost my voice. <coughs> <coughs> wow, I can't talk. Um, the Translator, which is one of the leading uh, journals in translation and interpreting studies. Um, her research has appeared in translation studies, the translator, target, language, communication, and numerous uh, edited collections. And in 2017, she was appointed to the Fulbright Specialist roster for 2017 to 2020 in the field of translation and migration studies. I should also mention that uh, Dr. Ingaleri is offering a, a mini course this week in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese uh, on uh, translation interpretation in conflict zones and also in migration uh, contexts, and um, you can find out more about that by contacting uh, the Spanish department if you, you're interested in participating in that. Uh, as at this point, you could audit the class or just listen in, and it's been a great experience so far. So I'll turn the time over to Dr. Ingaleri. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate um, in the uh, Kennedy Center um, um, program. Um, I'm really enjoying being on your campus and uh, meeting some of the students. And uh, yes, I welcome any of you to continue. Um, if we'd like to, to um, sorry, if you'd like to join us, um, uh, we'll be talking today and tomorrow about um, conflict, conflict zones. And on um, Friday, we'll be talking about transnationalism. Um, OK, so with his simple phrase, no ideas but in things, William Carlos Williams, the renowned American poet who worked simultaneously as a medical doctor in the town of Patterson, New Jersey, for much of his life, reiterated the philosophical idea that existence precedes essence. That is, that there can be no ideas of things without the things themselves existing first. With respect to poetry, this meant that words themselves had a materiality, one kind, a sound and a form on the page that conveyed meaning beyond the abstract sense of the words, and another kind, the illocutionary force of the word before it is unpacked, the juxtaposition in this poem of the white chickens and the red wheelbarrow glazed with rain. For Williams, much depended on the power of images, grounded as he was, in the imagist insight that words can, like a bolt of lightning, illuminate for an instant a whole landscape of meaning. Unlike words in the hands of the poets, however, words written or uttered within or about highly political charged contexts of contemporary migration frequently fail to illuminate the landscape of meaning pertaining to the events associated with the movement of people within or across borders. There is strong evidence that, paradoxically, the more stories told about what led migrants to flee in search of refuge, including instances of casual brutality, rape, torture, and other forms of violence, the more they seem to lose their power and significance and fail to adequately, adequately represent the experiences that lie behind them. And there is little evidence of the type of transnational dialogue envisioned by political philosophers like Saleh Ben Habib and others, during which across a number of different iterations, the performative force of a linguistic utterance breaks from f prior contexts of a socially established meanings. The sociologist Pierre Bourdieu has always insisted that the power of language is not invoked linguistically in any case, and that authority comes to language from the outside. Hence the dif difficulty of discursive gaps to emerge that can challenge socially pre-established grounds of legitimate meanings and forms of expression. For Bourdieu, where a language has no prior authorization, it cannot produce new forms of legitimacy. This would require a break with social conventions and modes of practice, both inscribed in language and embodied or enacted through dominant beliefs, practices, and institutions. 
So this leads me to the question in the case of translation and interpreting studies of how to expand or create new authorized discourses within this interdisciplinary field aimed at reinvigorating a productive transnational dialogue around migration. So in my talk today, I propose an expanded set of transnational, uh, translational norms in which narrative context can be framed alone or in conjunction with written or spoken language that might better challenge persistent biases and established binaries which in the current context of international mass migration, words alone have failed to do. So I'll be presenting examples of art and artifacts that describe from the outside or reflect from the inside the experiences of some migrants whose first and increasingly final destination is a detention camp or a refugee camp where they are often held under inhumane conditions indefinitely in many cases before either being deported or removed to a temporary or permanent residence, most often not of their own choosing. I'm, I view these centers as new cities being created across the globe that are changing landscapes, transforming border towns and offshore islands from places of hope to places of despair. Within the social sciences, materiality as a concept is used across different disciplines to focus attention on the impact of material or physical factors in relation to a particular phenomenon. The Canadian philosopher Marshall McLuhan famously used the line, the medium is the message, by which he suggested that the form in which people transmitted ideas was consequential in and of itself at the same time that the influence, whether positive or negative, of a particular medium could be invisible and difficult to characterize or predict. This was writing in the 1960s. I'm not sure what he would make of 2019 <laughs> in terms of all the forms and all the media that we now use to translate messages, to transfer messages. Um, but he was particularly interested in uh, the effects on viewers of a phenomenon of new forms of mass media, for example, the television. Um, so we're, we've come a long way, but I think his, his words still have a lot of meaning. For McLuhan, it wasn't the relationship between form and content that mattered, but form and its effect on audiences. So the media I'll be discussing are not normally used as instruments of communication by translators and interpreters. These are not viewed as authorized tools of communication for interpreters or translators within most institutional contexts. So it, wouldn't be con it would be considered well outside the norm, for example, and most certainly not referred to as translation proper, whatever that means, to rewrite a technical manual as a series of paintings or to include a translator's illustrations in a conventional literary translation or to show a film to an official at a border crossing to help interpret a request for asylum. Yet art and artifacts can certainly deliver a punch, express an emotion, or convey the workings of institutions in ways that words alone cannot. So my first set of examples will be illustrating um, departures and the second set of detention. Oop. My first example is from the work of Jacob Lawrence, an African-American painter based in New York in the first half of the 20th century. Lawrence sought to chronicle the northward migration of African Americans, which began in 1915 and continued over decades, during which time over six million people headed to northern and western cities in the U.S., fleeing the Jim Crow South, seeking the possibility of better opportunities. Both Lawrence's parents were from Virginia, and would later meet in Atlantic City, New Jersey, where Lawrence was born and spent his early childhood. Both his parents had taken part in the migration and had shared their stories with him. After living in Philadelphia for a while, around 1930, at the age of 13, Lawrence settled with his mother and siblings in Harlem, in New York City. Both just over 100 years ago in 1917, sorry, born just over 100 years ago in 1917, Lawrence is one of the most important American artists of the 20th century. He was the key artist in the closing years of the Harlem Renaissance, and in 1941, the first black artist to be represented by a New York gallery while only 24 years old. In that same year, 26 of his panels 
of, of the 60 panel migration series appeared in Fortune magazine, followed by an exhibition of the entire series at a prestigious downtown gallery. Lawrence called the small pictures painted in tempera on hardboard panels the migration of the Negro. The series opens with an image of a chaotic crowd in a train station. The important role uh, pushing toward three ticket windows marked Chicago, New York, and St. Louis. The important role these cities played was noted in Emmett Scott's 1920s book, Negro Migration During the War, which was one of the first scholarly books to note the magnitude and significance of the event. Along with other books, newspapers, pamphlets, and illustrated magazines, it constituted an important part of Lawrence's extensive research before embarking on the series, conducted at Harlem's branch of the New York Public Library. The paintings were derived from this research, and notes which were turned into captions with the help of his wife and fellow artist, Gwendolyn Knight. Once the panels were finished, they edited the captions to eliminate all but what they considered the essential information they wanted to convey. In 1993, for one of the first tours of the entire series, Lawrence changed its title from The Migration of the Negro to The Migration Series and rewrote the original 1941 captions. Uh, did I say in, in 1993? I don't know if I said 43 there. The caption accompanied this first panel originally read, during the World War, there was a great migration north by southern Negroes, and was later changed to, during World War I, there was a second migration north by African Americans, reflecting the fact that there had been a second world war since then, and a change in racial self-designation. Images of train stations, waiting rooms and railroad cars filled with people leaving, arriving, and acculturating into new environments recur throughout the series. The individual agency involved in migrants' decisions is illustrated in many of the panels as well. This one. So you can see the, the different, the, the ways that, that the, um, the comments on the slides were changed. It, uh, uh, interestingly, just to say about this slide, a, a colleague of mine, uh, when I showed him this, um, noted that it was a very early example, right, of migration due to climate change or you know, due to the wet, due to climatic conditions, let's say, yeah? <coughs> Which we'll no, no doubt see a lot more of. Um, and there are also many slides that speak directly to the social, economic, and ideological structures that shaped these decisions. The interweaving of image and text in the migration series allowed Lawrence to explore and reveal the multiple dimensions of the migration story he wanted to tell. The visual images are not and were not intended to be literal representations of what was expressed in the written historical accounts about events and emotions. The last panel of the series was captioned, and the migrants kept coming shows a crowd of faceless men, women, and children standing on one side of a train platform with their bags and suitcases, collectively adorned in different shades of color. The art historian Richard J. Powell compares this painting to the medley of intermittent, brilliant colors springing from a new African-American quilt. Lawrence's indistinguishable masses bring an eye-catching palette and vibrancy to the otherwise monochromatic train station. He portrays these passengers as people in transition to a new state of mind and body, stepping hopefully into an uncertain future, making their own history, mindful but undeterred by the certain knowledge that in the destinations to which they were headed, their struggle against discrimination and exploitation would continue. In Lawrence's paintings, what the viewer catches is a moment that has just become and will change any second. In this sense, his work explores the different degrees of diffusion, appropriation, assimilation, resistance, and enduring ambivalence that all migrants undergo. 
and the importance of the lived environments in which these new modes of perception connected to these experiences are negotiated, configured, and challenged. <clears throat> in his walks along the seashore near the ancient port city of Ugarit, Syria, Syrian artist and sculptor Nizar Ali Badr always admired the stones on the beach and in the clear blue water. For his latest project, he has gathered these stones and turned them into a medium for his art to tell the story of his fellow Syrians forced to flee their homes due to the ongoing violence. His images are composed entirely of stones, solid rocks arranged in such a way as to display an intense emotional range from love and joy to sorrow and anguish. He often doesn't have the money to buy the glue that would give permanence to his art, so that after taking a photo of a piece, he'll often take it apart again and use the stones for another, uh, for another painting, for another picture. In 2016, some of his pieces were published as a storybook for children called Stepping Stones, written in English by the Netherlands-born Canadian children's author Margret Roers and translated into Arabic as The Stones of the Rose by Falah Rahim, a Canadian Iraqi translator and writer, both of whom live in British Columbia. The translator re relates that the book was first sent to him with just the text, not any of the artwork. When he received the first draft with the artwork, he asked the publisher to let him revise his translation in the light of the pictures. The first thing he revised was his title, which he had translated as The Threshold of Departure, because he took a literal meaning of the title, Stepping Stones. Once he saw the pictures, he said he realized that the stones were the medium of communication, and that they therefore needed to be mentioned in the title. He tried to capture the double meaning of the title of the stones as a kind of hurdle, but also of progress on the journey, hence the stones on the road, of the road. With the addition of the written captions in Lawrence's series and the, addition of the, and, the, and the addition of the author's text in Stepping Stones, intersemiotic translation becomes a powerful mode of communication, carrying source texts, objects, and figures across sign systems, creating a dialogue between signs and their forms of representation. Here are just a couple of examples. And I, I noted actually um, this time that um, if you go, if you remember the there's the slide, um, the last this slide here. Lynching, of course, was something that was done to people, right, in the South. Um, hanging is often a way of uh, of refugees committing suicide, either on their way or in the detention camps basically due to a despair that, they'll, that anything will ever change in, in terms of their uh, current situation. So Lawrence's abstraction from the literal, employed through his blocks of vivid color and unindividuated faces and bodies, was his bridge to a commentary on the broader human level, a view without obstacles or restricted perspective, but with an immediacy of presence. The same can be said of Ali Badr's stone images. Both artists create a unique art language, part figurative, part abstract, playing with elements of color, line, shape, tone, and texture to interpret a migration story that reveals the physical labor and emotional complexities of very different journeys covering 100 years apart. There is, an effect, there is an effective multimodality in their work that maintains the same communicative power across each series. The reflective semantic process vividly portrayed in their work is reminiscent of translators' attempts to get each shade of meaning exact against a background of alternate meanings. Words create for translators what color and form create for these visual artists, structures of feeling. So my next slide, It's a story of um, in, uh, Dawid Hari in 2003, who's a Zagawa, Zagahawa tribesman from Western Sudan. 
and was among the hundreds of thousands of villagers attacked and driven from their homes by Sudanese government-backed militia groups. With his village burned to the ground and his family decimated and dispersed, Hari escaped, eventually finding safety across the border in Chad. With his high school knowledge of English, Hari offered his services as a translator and guide, risking his life to help ensure that the story of his people was told while there was still time to save them. His memoir, The Translator, is a first-hand account of the brutal genocide in Darfur. He writes, I had two choices. I could pick up a gun and join one of the rebel groups fighting the government troops in the Janjaweed. But to kill people is not a good idea for me. I do not hate anyone, and I have never harmed anyone in my life. So I chose to use my English instead to get food and medicine for my people and translate their stories so the world can know what is happening. Despite official denials at the time, the evidence was overwhelming that the Sudanese government had been training, arming, and paying the Janjaweed militia to kill the non-Arabs in Darfur and clear them off the oil-rich land. And while on a fact-finding mission to eastern Chad in June and July of 2007, a researcher from the human rights organization Waging Peace was told by Darfuri women in a refugee camp how their children had witnessed horrendous events when their, when their villages were being attacked. They told her, if you want information, you should ask the children. This prompted her to talk to the children who ranged in age from 8 to 15, many of whom had, um, <clears throat> had been forced from their homes three or four years earlier. With the help of interpreters who spoke Arabic and the languages of Darfur, she asked the children to write down their memories. One of them asked if they could draw instead. They drew pictures showing the villages full of tanks and armed men on horseback, houses on fire, and helicopters circling the skies. Villages are shown under attack, women are led off in chains, and civilians are shot at and try to defend themselves with spears and arrows. Helicopters bear the markings of the military aircraft, and the men in camouflage are labeled by the children as Janjaweed militia. The interpreters asked the children to tell them what, what, was in their, what was in their pictures and wrote their explanations down on the back of each one. Each drawing also has the name of a child, their home village, and their age at the time of the drawing and of the time of the attack written on the back. In November of 2007, the drawings were submitted to the International Criminal, Criminal Court in The Hague by waging peace and were accepted as contextual evidence of the crimes committed in Darfur and used in the trials of the accused as a graphic illustration of the atrocities. The fact that the pictures didn't point to any particular accused person protected the children against having to appear or give testimony before the court. Taken together with other documents, they helped confirm the fact that the Darfur population had been attacked by the Janjaweed militias. The original 500 drawings have since been donated by Waging Peace to the University of South Florida Libraries Holocaust and Genocide Studies Center. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to now shift from events leading to the departures of migrants to the matter of their detention. Of course, not all migrants are detained upon their arrival, but as countries around the globe are increasingly unwilling to grant hospitality, particularly to refugees and asylum seekers, within their borders, long-term detention has become a common practice. An early example of long-term detention took place in the lesser-known prison-like detention center established off the coast of San Francisco in the late 19th century, sometimes referred to as the Ellis Island of the West. However, the experiences of many of the mostly East Asian immigrants were radically different from those landing in New York, occurring as they did under the shadow of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The emotional impact of, the, of their experience is confirmed in oral histories <clears throat> of Chinese immigrants and in the poems they left behind, which were discovered only in 1970 by a park ranger. In addition to poems, drawings of birds, fish, horses, ships, and flags were also carved into the walls, the only signs of life during long periods of detention seen outside the windows or in brief indoor bre outdoor breaks. Taken together, they express the isolation, despair, and anger that resulted from prolonged confinement or imminent deportation. 135 of these calligraphic poems survived, 
And here are just a, two of these in translation. They were inked or carved into the walls of the detention barracks. Any discerning uh, Chinese translators, th these poems are not a translation of this, <laughs> so, just so you don't get confused. <clears throat> Excuse me. Other equally powerful artistic expressions have emerged from more re from more recent refugees and asylum seekers held in makeshift detention centers across the globe. The next examples are of paintings done by artists during long periods of confinement in Australian detention centers like that constructed on Nauru, a neighboring island, where artists there captured some of the effects of men, on men, women, and children of prolonged lengths of time spent waiting in a state of virtual incarceration. I, this is the, the, these are the most recent uh, statistics. It's kind of changing. Uh, Australia has been put under a lot of pressure to shut down some of these offshore islands. Um, so right, right now, as you see, there are only 288 people left. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about that as I go along. In the Villawood Detention Center, located outside Sydney, an innovative technique known as coffee paint painting was initiated by one of the Iraqi detainees held there. With no access to paints, he started using instant coffee powder diluted in water. He passed the technique to a fellow artist, Al Alifado, who would spend over five years in Villawood before being released. <coughs> In his book, Asylums, this sociologist Irving Goffman describes in harrowing terms the social and cultural lives of inmates in what he refers to as total institutions, places of residence and work where a large number of like-situated individuals cut off from the wider society for an appreciable period of time together lead an enclosed, formally administered round of life. The central feature of total institutions can be described as a breakdown of the barriers ordinarily separating those various spheres of life. Hence, Goffman's use of the term total, whose main dimensions are as follows. First, all aspects of life are conducted in the same place and under the same single authority. Second, each phase of the member's daily activity is carried out in the immediate company of a large batch of others all of whom are treated alike and required to do the same things together. Third, all phases of the day's activities are tightly scheduled with one activity leading at a prearranged time into the next, the whole sequence of events being imposed from above by a system of explicit formal rulings and a body of officials. Finally, the various enforced activities are brought together into a single rational plan purportedly designed to fulfill the official aims of the institutions. In 1918, sorry, 2018, an award-winning book about the conditions inside another of Australia's island's prisons, the detention center on Manus Island, <coughs> revealed a powerful picture of how such totalizing institutions function. The book was tapped out on an iPhone in a series of messages by one of its detainees, the Iranian Kurdish writer, journalist, and filmmaker, Beruz Bouchani and beautifully illustrated by the University of Sydney humanities professor, Ahmed Tofigian. The two communicated via Facebook and then WhatsApp with no direct real-time conversation. No friend but the mountains, 
the title which comes from an old Kurdish adage, the, Tur the Kurds have no friends but the mountains, is a searing portrayal of life in detention centers. And as one reviewer wrote, it is written with the lyricism of a poet, the literary skills of a novelist, and the profound insights of an astute observer of human behavior. Shortly after arriving on the island in August 2013, Buchani began making contact with journalists and human rights defenders outside the camp, gathering information about human rights abuses within the camp. He slowly built up a network of contacts in Australia and was regularly quoted as an unnamed source in newspaper articles. After his first two years, he eventually started writing under his own name, becoming a spokesperson for the other detainees. So in, in October 2017, Buchani, along with hundreds of other detainees, was forcibly removed to accommodation outside the detention center. Some weeks after, it was officially closed, <clears throat> though they were forced to remain on the island in squalid conditions, as the Australian government policy is never to resettle anyone from offshore detention in Australia. Their only options were to settle in Papua New Guinea, successfully apply for U.S. Settle resettlement, find their own way to another country through sponsorship or go back to their home country. In September of this year, Manus was emptied of its more than 60 detainees who were flown to Papua New Guinea. Of those who had been deemed non-refugees, 53 have re-entered a detention center there. Buchani was offered a visiting professorship recently in the School of Law at Birkbeck, University of London, which began this September. <laughs> this basically is a result of the publication of this book, which drew, uh, which won awards and uh, drew a lot of attention to um, to him, but also, uh, more importantly, to the conditions um, that he had been and other, many others had been living on, uh, living in for uh, over five years. <coughs> Sorry, <clears throat> reading no friend but the mountains. One is keenly aware of the function of the translator in ensuring that the response of the reader's senses is the same as if it were being read in the original language. What is compelling and revealing in Buchani's writing are his acute observations about humanity and inhumanity and the interaction between the two. There is much detail about, about the minutiae of life in detention and also intelligent and rich interpretation of all that is happening around him in real time. Buchani's ability to be inside the experience and simultaneously outside of it is extraordinary, as is the extent to which the synergy is captured in the translation. In a recent email exchange I had with the translator, he emphasized how in integral Buchani was to the translation process. He, he wrote, we were discussing my interpretation and decisions at every step. This is on the iPhone. <laughs> In fact, the original par Farsi has to be edited now to correspond with the modifications before it can be published. I think a huge part of the success is that Beruz and the two consultants I worked with were so deeply involved and committed throughout the process. I call it a shared philosophical activity. We represent a kind of collective agency. In reading the book, I was struck by how many times Buchani referred to the interaction between material objects and the way that power and control were wielded within the institution. According to Tofigian, Beruz was adamant that had the refugees not established a relationship of respect with the environment and animals, the oppressive force of the prison would have killed them a long time ago, that nature worked with the prison to combat the system. In his writing, all these transhuman objects, in my way of conceptualizing them, become a mode of translation for Buchani. They serve as a means for expressing what is being felt or thought inside the selves of the detainees. <clears throat> I'd like to explore this idea further with another poem by William Carlos Williams. The poem, which Williams calls a kind of song, 
is a kind of song to the creative process. Williams proposes the writer as a snake, acutely watchful from a point that is hidden from view, alert and tireless in its observing, bringing together the realm of the human and the existential realm of things, people and stones. In Williams' poetry, sharp concrete images not only precede ideas about them, but open us up to the sudden and concentrated illumination of a whole landscape. couple more slides and then get to the poem. This is actually a, a photo of the, the flower that, to which he refers, yeah? <clears throat> okay. So the very last line of this poem captures the power of Buchani's work perfectly. Saxifrage is also called rock breaker, which is the translation of its botanical name, saxifraga, which literally means stone breaker from the Latin saxum, or rock or stone. Frangere to break and frangere to break. Buchani's writing, despite the obstacles it encountered, managed to break through and expose the practices of the total institutions created by the Australian government on Manus Island and the others. There's a clear parallel in Buchani's method of working through some of the bare existential things he observes in his position as refugee, detainee, and writer. Many of these objects come to signify in very specific ways both the departure and detention phase of his migration and incarceration. So I'd like to read some short excerpts now from the book that pertain to a few of these objects. Uh, I'll see what I have in terms of time. This first one I'm going to uh, read is uh, regarding the boat. This is from his text. <laughs> it's midnight, completely dark. The formidable waves beat the body of our splitting boat without interruption. The smashing waves engender a mixture of terror and lament in our thoughts. The front tip of the boat ruptures and water bursts out from under the family mem members still lying entangled. The sealed hole in the engine room resigns itself to the pressure of the waves and the water rises again. The other passengers all wake suddenly from sleep to be confronted with death. We are all damp and numb, but we all continue bailing, knowing we would be dead within the blink of an eye. The whole mess in the darkness of midnight looks like death, smells like death, embodies death. The cries, the screams, the swearing, the knocking about, the sounds of small children, the heart-wrenching and painful sounds of the little children. These sounds transform the chaotic boat into hell. The buckets speed up and the water is quickly emptied. It seems to me the women are fighting off death even more bravely than the men. Their maternal instincts make of them predatory she-wolves. They stare down the ocean, revealing their sharp teeth. In the depths of darkness, on the verge of losing all hope, one still maintains a glimmer of hope. Deep down inside, a tiny light, about the size of a speck, like a distant star, is spotted on the horizon of this dark night. And then the next one is the generator. As midnight draws closer, the prisoners retire to their foam mattresses, return to sleep after a day of commotion. Suddenly, the generator quits again. Another hammer clobbers the head of the prison. Everyone's hopes and dreams maneuver in tandem with the unbearable intensity of heat, seeping alongside each other into the tapestry of nightmares. Startled out of sleep, the prisoners wake, sweating, heads bursting as though in a furnace not to forget the mosquitoes. Now, without any fans operating, the mosquitoes venture more ruthlessly into the rooms. Within minutes, the prisoners escape the rooms and drop directly into the black of night, unleashing a monsoon of profanities. The swearing echoes through the abyss of darkness that restrains the prison. The fear of the officers results in, get in getting the generator up and running a lot quicker this time. When the lights go out, the prison transforms into a dangerous beast. 
At any moment, an un uncontrollable situation can emerge. The generator has a face with the following features. A device resembling someone of old age, constituted by an intricate system of deteriorating wires, poles and pipes of rusty metal, probably within a dingy space somewhere worse than the prison, covered by an old cloth, under the protection of a rag, a rag that is withering away. The generator is withering away. I want to believe the generator is a living being with a soul, an organism that takes pleasure in throwing the prison into disarray whenever it feels like it. And one more, the milk. At times, the cooks express a small amount of generosity and pour half a glass of milk for every prisoner. The cook is so stingy and calculated and careful not to exceed the halfway line when pouring the milk into the small plastic cups that he is like a woman from the village extracting milk from a cow. He pours out some milk, lifts the cup, takes a really close look at it, and if he concludes that the amount he has poured is below the level that the system has determined is exactly right, then he will add a few drops. The cooks have become so skillful that they usually fill half a cup in one go. If it, is, if it so happens that a cook miscalculates and the milk exceeds half a cup, he puts the milk aside and prepares another with more precision. But then our understanding of this scenario suddenly collapses. On rare occasions, the generosity of the cooks peak. On these occasions, they pour a full cup of milk for each prisoner. I mean exactly double the usual amount. Occasionally, they pour only a quarter of a cup of milk. In all these cases, the cook completes the task with precision, careful not to pour one drop more or less than the limit prescribed. Trying to understand the conditions of microcontrol and macro control, trying to understand the perpetual flux of everything, trying to avoid tipping over the edge, trying to avoid tipping into insanity. Okay, I just have another few, few little thoughts. I'm going to end my paper with some brief tentative thoughts on what I'm proposing about the expansion of translational norms and the potential of new forms of materiality to become involved in particular contexts of translation. In each of the examples discussed here today, it seems to me that something happened that could not have happened or might not have happened with words alone. That is, words abstracted from the things they represented. The translations bring something to life to consciousness in a way that neither transcends or is unfaithful. These questions become irrelevant to some extent. What is relevant is their ability to illuminate meaning in a new way. This has nothing to do with conveying the sense of the meaning. It's more than that. What Jacob Lawrence accomplished with his migration series was to make visible the internal migration of African Americans into the larger narrative of the United States and educate not only African Americans at the time, but the wider public about the motivations and consequences of this event. What Ali Bader's art artworks of stone allow us to better understand is the overlap and intimacy that exists between human and non-human features of the migration experience. What the children of Darfur did from inside their refugee camp was to testify to the atrocities they witnessed in a medium that gave power to their young voices. This is not art as therapy, though it may have had a positive effect on their emotional well-being. This was testimony that could stand up in an international court. The poems and other objects produced on the walls of Angel Island recorded the prolonged detentions of Chinese immigrants and citizens, one of the many negative consequences of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which, whose repercussions are still felt to this day. The art produced as a result of lengthy detentions in offshore Australian prisons in real time function simultaneously as protest, testimony, and education. It gives the refugees transformed into prisoners by the state a public presence at the time it forces us to acknowledge and decide what we will do about these immoral and inhumane actions of our government. These artists are not translations or interpreting scholars or practitioners in the way we think of these within our field, but what they do educate, testify, protest, reflect, and make visible can certainly be things that we perceive of the field of translation and interpreting studies doing. In our thinking about translation, we tend to focus on the content of the message, hence obsession with notions like faithfulness and impartiality. But translation is also a medium of communication. And given that, surely it has the power and must use this power to shape human association and action. Thank you.
very much. Uh, indeed, we know that so some of you will have to leave for class uh, in two places so uh, quietly. Uh, but if we have any questions, we invite you to come up here to the microphone because we're recording this. We want to get the question as well as. Uh, Shall I um, move, move over? No, oh, just, oh, just, just slide, uh, slide over a bit. So. political science and Spanish. Mm -hmm. And my question, I think it's really interesting to see uh, the depth that using different materials brings. And I think, well, my question is, with that depth, does it bring more misinterpretation? And how is that kind of overcome? Hmm. So what do you mean by misinterpretation in that um, question? Just thinking and what's in, in, in your, this relationship with depth that you're making in relation to it. I mean, as you discuss, I think we can see more their perspectives, but I also think um, culture and putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, for saying it like that, can also lead to um, a lack of complete com mm -hmm. comprehension. So I guess my question is, is in looking in the artwork or the creations of people from other cultures, how do you, um, how do you jump over that gap, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I guess for me, um, I start with the, the, uh, the, like problematizing in the same way that you, you are problematizing the possibility, right? Um, the thing, the th the thing that my 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 interest in moving into art is simply because that's uh, up to this point mostly the only other way they have to mm -hmm. communicate is with words, right? The only other way they have to communicate is words that are translated, right? So in some ways, um, these paintings or these other ways of for of expressing their experiences are a little bit mediated, right? Mm -hmm. um, we uh, we are. In always with re with uh, refugee and asylum seekers trying to uh, find ho hospitality elsewhere, we're always in a position where we have to um, mediate lots of different discourses that that find their way between their stories and their reception, right? Um, because there is an activity as well that is happening behind that, which is the reason why they're fleeing, right? So whether it's a war, a famine. Something is happening, right? Mm -hmm. Real in the world, right? So there's a sense that by, in, in a sense, by forcing them to tell a story in order to gain hospitality, we're already um, misrepresenting mm -hmm. something because we're very aware of what's happening. So we're also, and I say we, a, a, a country, a, a receiving country, we're, we're actually already if we're if we deny that hospitality we're we're already almost saying it, it might be happening but it's not a, it's none of our concern mm -hmm. or it's not happening in the way you say it is i mean there's there's so many ways in which this idea that that we would ever get some kind of um i don't know i think you're almost like suggesting how do we ever get to the heart of the matter um, there, there, there is no. I mean, there is a heart of the matter if you're the refugee, but there are so many other matters that come that come along, and distort that, um, or or lit, or hear it, um, you know, with uh, with a, with a, with a um, with with, a, with reception, you know, rather than kind of uh, a, an idea of exclusion, right? So it's mm -hmm. it's very complicated, right? Yeah. But but for me, the art felt. F feels like it has at least a direct line of communication to the person. You know, we, we don't know, um, it, it, of course it doesn't tell us. Um, I mean, Buchani actually, going back to Buchani, his words actually are very, very, uh, so having said that words alone, but his words take, he's a, he's a, he's, in his hands he does something with these words that do sort of do that, right? But even his words, that's, that, those, um, that description of the boat, he, he was on that boat, but he wasn't writing it in real time, right? So even that is a memory for him. I mean, we're, we're yeah. never really outside of 
it's distorted communication, right? We're never really outside of semantic uncertainty. Uh, the idea that there's a, there's a way to sort of pull back all the, 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 the curtains of, 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 on meaning is, is, is an illusion in and of itself, right? Yeah. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. That's a really good question, though. Yeah. Uh, my name's Mike, and my question is about the paintings that you showed at the very beginning that had, like, the descriptions on the side. I noticed from, like, the original descriptions compared to, like, the updated descriptions, they got a lot shorter and a lot more direct. Why do you think that happened? Um, yeah, I think that, um, that, that, that Lawrence felt that, that uh, well, I, don't, I, can't say that, I can't say for certain, but my, my, my feeling is that, if you recall, I said that he had done a lot of work creating the captions from a lot of the research that he had done in the library, uh, you know, all these different written accounts, right? And I think um, that, so that's what he, that's what he put side by side with the, originally with the paintings. Then I think, first of all, I think he wanted to simplify some of the language. That was one thing, change some of the language. But I, I, my, I suspect that what he then felt that maybe it was still too much words, that right. the, he, the power of the, the paintings was really what he was after, and that he wanted to just make that less of a, um, of a component of the, of, for, the, for the viewer um, and let the paintings come out you know, more strongly than, that, that's my, what I would guess, yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, okay. 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 Faithful few, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>